Uh, my name is Angelo, and I am so very happy to be here. Um, this is my second time here in Bonaire. As you can tell, I love the food. Uh, and it's much better than the food in Grenada. Apologizing to the folks if anybody is from Grenada. Uh, my, I work for the Pew Charitable Trusts, which is uh, an organization uh, based in Washington, D.C. We work on a number of different issues from uh, health research to political polling uh, to environment issues. And I'm on Twitter. My name is Tau Tau Tasi. It's the Chamorro language for people of the sea. And feel free to tweet anything as long as it's good. Um, but before I get started, I just want to say thank you so much for, to DCNA and CIEE and uh, Stanapa for inviting me here. Any excuse to come down to Bonaire is uh, a good excuse. So uh, let's go ahead and jump into it. There we go. Uh, my agenda today is I'm, I'm just going to talk about sharks in Bonaire and around the world in general, uh, talk about some of the threats that sharks are facing, discuss uh, using shark sanctuaries as a, um, a policy option for protecting sharks, and then we're going to discuss how Bonaire can, can help out. So let's begin. Let's begin. All right. Now, every conversation about sharks is going to begin with this. Um, and that's what I hope to do here, is we're, we're just beginning this conversation about how Bonaire can protect your sharks. And when you begin that conversation, you have to realize that most people think sharks are bad. Uh, it's so much easier to work in koala bear conservation because they're cute and cuddly. Um, these guys have these things right here, um, and some people are afraid of those. Uh, if you're a fisherman, you think this is a nuisance. Uh, maybe this is a shark that gets into your lobster trap, or this is a shark that's taking tuna or mahi off your line. But we need to change that, that conversation. And we need to start thinking of, instead of you know, this big scary shark that you see in Shark Week, we need to start thinking about all the different kinds of sharks that are out there. Uh, sharks are, are very diverse. Uh, worldwide, there's 509 different species. Um, are any of the junior rangers here? Can you just raise your hand? Um, now just go ahead and put it over your mouth like this. Thank you. Uh, because I gave them the answer yesterday. So, uh, so don't yell it out. Uh, any guesses? How many threatened sharks do you think there are in Bonaire's waters? And, and I'm not talking about all shark species, just the, the, the ones that are threatened with extinction. Any guesses? Five? You have to put your hand over your mouth, too. I hear, I hear a five. Any lower? Higher? Twelve? Anybody? anybody five? Twelve? Anybody else? Three, three, five, or 12. Well, if you go to the IUCN red list, uh, org, you'll actually find that there are 27 species of shark living in your waters that are threatened or near threatened with extinction, and you can't even name them. Does that, does that cause you pause? You didn't even know that, but they're in your waters. Uh, and some of these species are things like this nurse shark. Um, this is probably the shark that you see most in your, on your dives. It it's, lives near the bottom, eats clams. It uh, doesn't really bite people, unless you kiss it. Has anybody seen the video of... <laughs> when you go home, Google nurse shark kiss. You'll, you'll appreciate it. Uh, it doesn't turn out well for the diver. Uh, oceanic white tip shark. Uh, this used to be probably the most abundant vertebrate on the planet um, until we started fishing them. And it's got this really beautiful um, rounded white fin up here. Oops, I pressed the wrong button. I thought I was hitting the laser. Um, beautiful fin. Um, in this part of the world, they've been reduced by 99.3%. So that, like, imagine you had a thousand sharks. There's only seven left. So these, these have been really hammered. Uh, and then uh, press the button. Anybody know what this guy is? Big beefy. Yeah, bull shark. Uh, you guys have these in your waters too. So sharks are diverse, but they're also very important. Um, and they're also important to that other species that is in this photo. That's us. Uh, and they're sort of important for two ways. One is an ecological reason. We've all heard that healthy oceans need sharks. Has anybody heard that before? Um, so what does that exactly mean? Uh, it's basically two different things. Sharks, uh, they, they change the behavior of other fish. Uh, now, my buddy Fernando, uh, he likes to go out, maybe have a couple drinks, have a good time, he's, you know, partying. Then you see a cop, a police officer, what do you do? You, maybe you, maybe you, 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 
you hide under the table, something like that. And sharks have the same effect on fish. Uh, sharks are like the police of the reefs, and they, they make the rest of the ecosystem behave better. Um, they, they keep fish and turtles from overgrazing seagrass or, or corals. Um, the other way is through trophic energy flow. And, and this is a little bit complicated, uh, but it, basically the take home message is if you don't protect your sharks, you're going to lose your coral reefs. If you lose your coral reefs, you're going to lose your fish. And then you're going to starve. And this has happened in places. Anybody been to Jamaica? Anybody go to the Jamaica in the 1960s? Nobody in the back? Nobody's that old? Uh, Jamaica fished out their sharks, uh, and if you go there now, they have no coral reefs, and if you go to the fish markets, you're looking at fish that are about this big. And uh, there's science being done at Scripps and uh, working with Mark Vermeer over in Carmabi um, that's, that, that's, that's teaching people about the links between uh, microbes and plankton and corals and herbivores and predators like sharks. So the take home message is, if you don't protect your sharks, you're gonna lose your coral reefs. And that's probably where you get most of your food. But sharks are also important for the, uh, the economy. Sharks are worth more alive. Uh, folks, the, the most exciting thing that you can see on a dive is a shark. Unless like a dinosaur, or, <laughs> right? or, or a mermaid. Um, but, but sharks are up there. Uh, and when you look at the value of these, uh, of these dives, um, you know, a, a shark dive can be worth $130, depending on which island you're at. And that person's staying in a hotel, they're eating at a restaurant, they're taking a taxi. Uh, and this is extremely valuable, especially to small island developing states, like Bonaire. You have some of the best diving in the world. Uh, the Bahamas is the shark dive capital of the world. Um, Palau also has some of the best shark diving in the world um, on the other side. The Palau number is interesting because 8% of their GDP, uh, the entire country, is from people going to that country just to see sharks. That's how important they are. And increasingly, because sharks are important, sharks are important for our ecosystems, sharks are important for our economies, they're being seen more as wildlife than a food source. And uh, people, the way we, we, we now look at whales, uh, we used to eat a lot of whales 100 years ago. Uh, there are still some countries that eat whales, um, but for the most part, the, the way we look at, at species like turtles and, and buffalo and koalas has changed because they're now wildlife instead of a food resource. Switching gears a little bit. Uh, I'm sure everybody's heard that sharks are in trouble. That's, that's the reason I'm here today, is to talk to you about some of that. Um, and the reason is because of their biology. Uh, sharks are just not like other fish. I gave this presentation earlier today, and I'm not going to whip it out, um, but I showed a video of a shark giving live birth. Uh, a shark might uh, have some babies every other year, and maybe a lemon shark will have one baby every other year. Um, shark, some sharks will have two to four to six, whereas a, a fish, like a skipjack tuna, can lay 1.8 million eggs every three days. And so the, the biology of a shark means that it just cannot reproduce uh, to the same amount of fish. So if we treat them like a fish, uh, we're going to be in trouble, which is why sharks are in trouble. So these are blue sharks. Can, can it, who's seen a shark in the water? Anybody? Who's not seen a shark in the water? Handful of people. You guys need to get in the water more. Uh, it helps if you put like a tuna fish in your, in your wetsuit. <laughs> uh, the, the sharks will, will, will come to you. Um, and I like to point out, you know, so these were caught on long lines in Japan, and sharks are rare. Uh, but this is a pile of 100 blue sharks, that's a pile of 100 blue sharks, and we're just, we're just hammering these populations. Um, I will point out, a lot, of the, a lot of what you've heard about sharks is the finning, you know, how cruel it is, how they cut off the fins uh, and then dump the sharks overboard. That's actually not much of a problem these days. Uh, we've, for the most part, solved that. Uh, we need to focus more on overall mortality. This is a port, and they've brought the sharks whole back to port. That's not to say that the fins don't have value. Uh, the fins still do have value. I've been in Chinatowns where they're selling for $1,500 per kilo, so that's like over $2,000 per pound. Um, and there's been a lot of work in Asia on reducing demand of shark fin, uh, but there, there's still a long way to go because the amount of shark fin being taken out of the ocean is just incredible. Um, this is in Taiwan, and this is a scene that you see every single day, just shark fins being dried out on a rooftop. Uh, Asia is definitely the hub of the shark fin trade. Um, Hong Kong 
probably accounts for about half of it. Uh, but the shark fins are coming from all over the world. There's 120 different countries that participate in the shark fin trade, and every country with a coast is catching sharks. Um, the circles are sort of like the size of the fishery, so the biggest fisheries are Spain, Indonesia, India, um, Taiwan, and then the arrows are sort of the amount of trade going to the countries. In this part of the world, Trinidad and Tobago um, are, are the big ones. They're kind of the, uh, the Hong Kong or the Caribbean, so if sharks, being caught in the Caribbean are all going to Trinidad they're before they're being shipped off to somewhere else. Um, and it, it is a global trade. I've, I've actually heard that some of the sharks caught in Fiji, they'll catch the shark whole, throw it in the freezer, bring it to Trinidad, where they process it, chop off the fins, the meat go to Brazil, and then the fins go to Hong Kong. So it, it's a global trade. We live in a, we live in a, a global society. But it's not just the fins. Uh, there, is, there are local threats to sharks. Um, this may or may not be a common sight uh, here in the Caribbean, just a fish market with a couple of baby hammerheads. Uh, they call these puppy sharks, some of the islands. Um, these are, it's three different species of dogfish, and you know, these just get fried up. It's a nice little lunch, a little snack. Uh, anybody who's been to Trinidad may have had shark and bake. Uh, it's pretty good, actually. If, in fact, I, I can't lie, you know, if you take, you could take a piece of tire and deep fry it and serve it with uh, the fry bread and put some garlic and some cilantro on it, mm, it's good stuff. Uh, so it's not easy uh, because, you know, people do like eating shark, even here in the Dutch Caribbean, and I don't know how in focus this is, but it says uh, hi and then tribon. This is over in, in Curaçao. And not quite sure where this shark came from. It could have come from Curaçao, it could have come from Mexico, it could have come from Fiji. As a result of this fishing, about 100 million sharks are killed each year. Uh, and this was an estimate by Dr. Boris Worm. And uh, it, it built upon the previous estimate of 73 million. And he looked at um, the number of sharks that are in the shark fin trade, as well as uh, bycatch, illegal fishing, um, and unreported. He made, they made estimates of unreported fishing. And this is actually a conservative estimate. Um, they, they think that as many as 263 million sharks are being killed each year. Uh, but what does that mean, right? Is it, you know, 100 million, 200 million? This represents a number uh, where we kill twice as many sharks as they're able to naturally reproduce. So when you, if you have a bank account and you take the money out twice as fast as it's going in, eventually you're going to run out of money. And that's what we're doing with sharks. And because we're killing sharks so fast, about one third of all species are, are threatened with extinction. Uh, there are, most of the species actually are not threatened with extinction. Um, and they're, they're like catfish and dogfish, maybe about this big, that live so deep that fishermen never catch them. Uh, the only reason we know that they exist is because the Smithsonian caught one in a trawl 60 years ago. Uh, things like the Campeche cat shark. Um, but if you can name a shark, name a shark it's going to be threatened with extinction. Uh, most of the sharks that you know are in trouble, like the ones that I listed at the very beginning of the presentation. So we're having a discussion. There are some folks here um, in Bonaire, uh, as well as in the, the wider Dutch Caribbean, that are, are thinking of creating a shark sanctuary. So what the heck is that? Uh, so they exist in a couple different places around the world. Um, this map is actually a little out of date, but all of the dark colors are ocean areas where sharks are protected. Uh, they've actually been protected in this entire area here, the Federated States of Micronesia. The Cayman Islands just approved shark protections a few months ago. Of course, Bonaire is down here. Uh, and the first place to do this was a, a small country called Palau, which is in uh, Micronesia in the Western Pacific, and they, they created sort of a sensation. Uh, the, 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 20 years ago, when we were talking about sharks, sharks were trash fish. They, we didn't need to worry about them. They were a nuisance. They, they were all over the place. And uh, we didn't even take data on them because they, we just didn't care about sharks. And this idea that you could protect these species was, was, a, was a, a new one that's only been around for about five years, well, six years. Crazy how time flies. Um, so Palau did this in 2009, and when they did it, it was like in every single newspaper and every single TV channel around the world. It, it created a sensation. And they went further than some other places because they actually protected all sharks, all shark species, and their entire country, including the waters. It wasn't like a marine protected area. Um, it wasn't 
Like you have a marine park here, it wasn't just the coastal waters, it wasn't half the waters, it was everything. You couldn't fish for a shark, you couldn't, uh, you couldn't uh, bring a shark to shore, you couldn't sell the shark once you had it. Uh, and, and these are just some of the, the policies that we recommend going into these, these shark sanctuaries. Things like, you know, banning the sale and possession, making sure that you can't import or export them. If you have a gear that's used specifically to catch sharks, um, and fishermen are brilliant people, uh, and oftentimes when they're using stuff to catch sharks, they'll call it like shark blank, like shark lines, things like that. Um, so you can ban shark lines. Using the definition where a whole country protects sharks, not just a small marine protected area, like uh, close to here is Los Aves and Los Roques, which protect sharks, they actually don't meet uh, the Pew definition of a shark sanctuary because it's not the whole country. Um, only 10 places around the world have actually done this. It's a, it's a very rare thing to do, um, and it's pretty amazing that here in Bonaire, you're considering creating a shark sanctuary. So you could be number 11 on the list. I'm going to skip that slide. Uh, when we talk about these shark sanctuaries, and I just put this in here because the first question I'll get tonight is, well, how do you enforce it? Um, there's, no, there's no silver bullet, and you kind of have to take a look at what the, the threats are on the individual island. Uh, I'm not completely sure what those are in Bonaire. All of you would know better than I. Uh, but in some of the other places, there are things like make sure that the, the fines are really high. Because that, remember that video of like the gigantic boats that were catching you know, giant nets full of fish? If you charge that boat $100, they're just going to think of that as a tax. It, it's, it's the cost of doing business. So those, those boats get fined $125,000. But here in Bonaire, you couldn't go to a fisherman and be like, ugh, you've got a shark, buddy. You owe me $100,000. Like, it's just unrealistic. Uh, so as you have this conversation, you need to think about how are we going to be able to enforce uh, some of these policies that we put into place. Uh, I, I think two of the most important things are regional collaboration. This is working with uh, Aruba and Curaçao and Venezuela. Uh, and then education. Is, you know, you want to make sure that people understand the need to protect sharks and that they, it's actually something that they want to do that they're not being told to do it. So regional collaboration, I, I did show a couple videos about the Pacific and Micronesia. And uh, this is my island here, Saipan. Bonaire's the second nicest island in the world. This is number, number one. Um, and this is an area that's the size of the European Union. Um, here's the Philippines, here's Papua New Guinea, Australia's down here. And I've, my organization has been working here for five years and in February, we closed down the Federated States of Micronesia, so we have this gigantic area of ocean where sharks, all sharks are protected. Uh, here's a map of the Caribbean. Uh, I've only outlined the islands. The yellow are places where sharks are already protected, so um, Honduras, Caymans, Bahamas, British Virgin Islands. Um, the red are places that uh, the idea of shark sanctuaries has progressed quite far, where there's actually like, people working on it. Uh, campaigns, and then the blue are places that we've spoken to some of the government officials and we think there's, that there's some interest. So if we can protect sharks here in Bonaire, um, and you, the, you've got sort of uh, like s territorial waters out to like 12 miles maybe, so sort of like, but then you have this like pizza sliced shaped area of water that is uh, also part of your EEZ. So, if we can protect the, the sharks here, we can also protect the sharks in Aruba, in Curaçao, and then across the entire Caribbean. Uh, just a couple of lessons that I've learned after doing this for five years. Um, probably the most important one is expect island time. Uh, if your presentation starts at 7, it actually means 7.10. Um, but if you, if you run a program that you think is going to run one year, it's going to take three. If you think it's going to take three, it's going to take seven. Just the realities of, of living on islands. Um, and you, you, you want to find out what the local threats are. Uh, you know, what are the issues facing your fishermen, facing you know, your dive operators, and what policies work for the problems that you're having here? Pictures of my team. Um, so we've got, uh, Pew's been working on sharks for about six years, and our team has 12 people. Uh, this is an old photo, we've actually added four more people in the last two months. Um, mostly Americans. 
Um, but we do have one staff from Trinidad now who works with us in DC. Uh, we also have sort of an army of contractors that work with us around the world, about 30 or 40 people. Uh, we offer lots of services, and this is the services. This is some of the stuff that we hope to do here in Curacao. We offer uh, policy advice. We could work with the government to have public hearings, to hear what the fishermen think. We also provide lots of science support. Uh, we're working on a number of different studies, all in the Caribbean. Uh, one of them is a global survey of diver shark sightings, and the hypothesis behind this is that there are probably, there are a few places around the world where you can regularly see sharks, and that there used to be more. So a student at Halifax University working with Boris Worm is basically going to contact the thousand dive shop owners around the world and ask them about sharks that they're seeing now and how it compares to 20 years ago. Uh, it, we sort of think the hypothesis is that people are seeing fewer sharks. Um, we're going to be working on some fishermen perceptions and attitudes with some grad students from York University, uh, working with Callum Roberts. They're at, someone's going to be coming here in August, I think. Uh, and then we're also working on a shark food in the Caribbean study. This is with the Smithsonian. And this is the shark and bake again. Uh, there's, some people think that they've run out of sharks in Trinidad and that they're actually selling catfish. So we're going to do some DNA testing to figure out what this actually is. Maybe it's catfish, maybe it's kingfish. And then there's also foods throughout the Caribbean that are supposed to be other things, but might end up being shark. And so this is like saltfish. And you know, saltfish is typically going to be like this size, and it's a fish. But every once in a while, we start, you, you see these big fillets. And what kind of fish? is big enough to be, you know, like a fillet. If, if, it's, if it's a swordfish, are you going to make saltfish out of that? No, that's, that's good eaten. So we have this hypothesis that a lot of the, the saltfish being eaten is, is actually shark. And we're looking for EDNA. EDNA stands for Environmental DNA. Uh, and eDNA is like biological dust. Um, anybody watch Star Trek? Any nerds? Original Star Trek, 1960s. Yeah, one in the back, all right. So, Captain, uh, Mr. Spock and Captain Kirk would come down on, the, uh, come down on a planet and Mr. Spock would like, get his tricorder out and be like, Captain, I'm not detecting any life. Uh, or maybe he would say, I am detecting life. So that technology, just like this was science fiction 20 years ago, uh, you know what else was science fiction 20, well, maybe 30 years ago? You're going to not believe this. Automatic doors. <laughs> You're like, you go to the grocery store, and the glass door just opens. In 1985, that did not exist. You had, there, was, there was like a pressure pad that you had to step on. And then like sometime in the early 90s, they created automatic doors, science fiction. And you wouldn't even know it. Right, older people? They're nodding in agreement, trust me. Uh, so there's this uh, biological dust. And uh, your body can actually identify different smells. Um, you're picking up DNA. Um, I smell smoke, I smell fish. Some people, when they s drink wine, they can actually tell you what different flavors are in there. Uh, this study is based on that, and instead of using your nose and your mouth, we're using machines to de detect DNA that's in the water. So you, you take some samples of water, you run it through a filter, you, uh, there's these things called primers, which propagates the DNA, and then you run it through an agar, and voila, it can tell you what's in it. So you can identify uh, different species of shark. And I was actually hoping that we would have the preliminary results. This is so cutting edge that they only just identified the first sharks using this a week ago. Uh, really, really cutting edge stuff. And I was hoping that we'd have more preliminary results, but it works. So th th there's a lot involved right now where you have to go out and get the water, take it back to shore, run it through the filter. But 20 years from now, Mr. Spock and his tricorder. And think just how easy that will make management. You, you will be able to go out, take a sample of water, and you'll know how many species are in your, in your water. Cool stuff. Uh, we do capacity building. Uh, we sh I showed a video. This is Captain Joey. Captain Joey trains with like the LA SWAT team. You do not mess with Captain Joey. He will kick your ass. Um, but these guys, uh, we, we do trainings out in the Pacific, and oftentimes in the Pacific, these, these cops, you know, they get to be like 20 years old, and they're looking for a job, and they ask their uncle, and uncle says, hey, you want, a cop? You want to be a cop? Yeah, sure, here's a gun, and you're, and you're a cop. 
um, and they, they've never handcuffed anybody. Uh, so we do a lot of really basic capacity building with, with folks out there. On the complete opposite end, from teaching people how to handcuff people, we work with uh, this company called the Virtual Watch Room to use satellites to catch illegal fishing vessels. And this is using AIS data, VMS data, and night photography to catch illegal fishing boats. And we ran a, a practice of this back in January, flipped the switch, very first day they caught a, a Taiwanese vessel fishing illegally in, in Palau's waters, brought the boat into shore, charged them $100,000. That pays for continued enforcement and also for like two or three enforcement officers for a year. Of course we do outreach. This is Carlisle from, uh, from, from uh, St. Eustatius. These are our shark attack survivors. I hear there's a shark attack survivor on Bonaire. And uh, who better else to advocate for sharks than people who've had their like, limbs ripped off by them? I probably shouldn't have made that joke because of a recording. This is going to end up on YouTube. <laughs> uh, it's going to bite me. Uh, this is our Shark Stanley campaign. And has anybody, has anybody met Shark Stanley before? No, okay, one person, wonderful. So he's, he's, he has to meet a lot more people. Shark Stanley is a, is a children's book based on this character, Shark Stanley. And I, I call it a campaign in a box that's great for educators or for advocates. And it's a suite of materials that we just give to teachers or to NGOs where they can run an education campaign or an advocacy campaign. And the education comes with the books and there's lesson plans and there's bumper stickers and pins on this table that I hope you all take home with you. But then there's also this petition and this, this idea that you cut out this character and take a picture of it and, that and then you post it to Twitter with the hashtag Shark Stanley and that shows that you support shark conservation. And we've used this all around the world. I think this is Oman, Korea's up there, this is Belize, Fiji's up there somewhere. Uh, and it builds these connections among children all around the world who are all reading the same book and all learning about the importance of sharks. And we, it, the original book is in English, but we have translations in Spanish, Dutch, and then both types of papiamento, which I hope will be coming to the island in a couple of weeks. Uh, some of your leaders, is any of the guys? Is, no, they're at the bar. Uh, <laughs> Kai and Tadzio are here. Um, and then some of you might know Frank. And they met Richard Branson in the Bahamas a few months ago and, and talked about sharks, shark conservation. So, you guys are about to begin a conversation on whether or not you should protect sharks here in Bonaire. Uh, I hope that I can help. And these are just a couple of ideas that I have. Uh, I've actually learned that Bonaire actually protects sharks in your local waters a couple of years ago. So congratulations. Um, but I think there's some clarification on what that, that did anybody know that? that sharks were protected in Bonaire. So there, there needs to be a conversation about what that law actually means, but I've been told it's on the books. Um, but just, you know, the first person you need to educate on these issues is yourself. So, you know, take some time and, and learn about the issues that sharks face and their importance to your, your waters. Uh, and then the first person you talk to, um, the person who bosses me around is my wife. Uh, you know, so talk to your family first. Uh, and then if you think that you want to protect sharks, you can get involved by uh, talking to DCNA or STANAPA and, and get involved with their projects to protect sharks. And with that, I thank you. Yes. Okay, good. Angela, I've been in the water a lot mm -hmm. here, and I've seen one shark in 23 years. Mm -hmm. um, a nerf shark. Uh, I don't dive to the wild side. Mm -hmm. I've been born. But I'm wondering so, who are all the sharks that you listed? Yeah. Uh, so, that's pretty typical. Uh, near shore, the, the sharks that you're going to see. Uh, in the Caribbean, or you're going to see Caribbean reef sharks and nurse sharks, maybe the occasional hammerhead. Uh, yeah, but a lot of those sharks are open water sharks, so like the blues and oceanic white tips. 
Some of them are deep water sharks, like the threshers, and you'll, just, you'll probably just never come across those in a dive. Yeah. You can see them in the Red Sea in the Philippines, and that's about it. Uh, part of it is just sharks are rare to begin with. They're, they're, they're predators, and so there's going to be fewer sharks than there are parrot fish and groupers. And the other part is their, their populations have been hammered. There just aren't as many sharks on. Even here. In the, yeah, even here. I, I died here since 1948, and on the rough side also. Mm -hmm. And they're all really gone. I mean, they, they were all over, and now you see one on the rough side, you see one, one shark in, in what, 20 died, 30 died? It's amazing. I mean, it's too late, I think. They're gone. Oh, it's never too late. I, I also think if 100 million sharks are killed mm -hmm. a year, will the one or two we catch here for the thing? You, you can't, yes, it'll make a difference to that shark. Uh, but you know, you, you can't do it alone. Um, no, but shouldn't be at the place where they get so many sharks and they're hundred, you know, in Japan or whatever. Mm -hmm. Work there, not here. We are. Work is being done here, but uh, you, you also need to protect sharks in your waters. Because the, the benefits that you can get from having sharks benefit you. They don't benefit the people yeah. in Japan. Uh, and, and you see that uh, the sharks don't have reefs. Correct. So our sharks are gone. It's not necessary to do, I think. Like, I, I come from Amazon, and we actually see such sharks pretty often. And we're pretty close by, and I'm sure you guys have sharks as well. But the difference is maybe I'm from Aruba, and Aruba has a lot of shark sightings. They catch regularly, and they catch sharks. And I do think you have it in your waters. It's just you don't see it as much because of the geography, maybe. But I'm sure they're there. I'm definitely, we're too close by. It's not saying. And if you're going to have the protection in your waters, it's also going to help move as well. You already have laws in place that are much better enforced uh, in comparison to Aruba. So you're also be helping other islands as well. And so that should be considered. We Sorry, I have a question. Sure. Which are the laws in Bonaire? Because I sh most of the sharks, I, I dive every day. I can say that I see one shark every probably 200 dives. Okay. And I see most of the sharks that I see in Bonaire are on the picture on Facebook killed by a fisherman and showed as a trophy. Yeah. So, so somebody's how, catching what them. What is the situation in Bonaire? I, I actually don't know the full answer to that. Um, there are probably a couple people in this room who know it better than me. No, so she's asking, uh, she sees one shark every 200 dives, but on Facebook, she sees uh, the fishermen Show it. showing their trophy. sharks as a trophy. Not, not few just a few months ago, at uh, the Vista Blue, people with fishermen taking pictures with the fins, with the head of a shark. Another one is something special, maybe a year ago, with a few hammerhead, a couple of hammerhead. They actually uh, tried to catch this hammerhead that I saw diving. Mm -hmm. days before, everybody knew that the hammerhead were something special. Fishermen went there, they tried to hook them with throwing some goats and some blood, and, that, and they killed it and left it on the beach for a while. And then took a picture and they showed it on Facebook. So um, my question is, what is, there is a law at the moment that is protecting the shark in Bonaire, it's just not enforced, but there is a law or there is no law? I have been told that there actually is a law. Yes, there is a law. All sharks are protected by law. Well, we're embarking on a three-year project now to raise awareness on shark protection, all those laws, and what it means, and what the consequences are um, for you know catching sharks and displaying them. Obviously, there's a cultural, you know, uh, fishermen have uh, their side of the story as far as why they catch sharks, and most of the time, not always, but a lot of the times, it's bycatch. You know go out and catch sharks and just accidentally catch them. And they have, you know, they have a different attitude towards it. They had it online already. It's going to die anyway, so they, so they might as well, they might as well eat it again. So that's their, uh, their attitude towards it, and it's uh, very marketable this project. But change that, that but there is a law that yes. says that you should, you cannot fish sharks. What is the law saying? There's a law that says that all sharks are protected all the way around. And I'd like to, to add that culturally, I would almost think this hammerhead thing, which I was not aware of, 
um, would have been, um, there's a fear, you know? There's, people fear sharks, and all the lectures we've been having, no one's ever talking that people are afraid of sharks. So we're all focusing from our viewpoint of we are aware, we know we need to take care of them, but the general population out there is afraid. And I think that the, this neighborhood catching the shark at something special, which is right here in the bay, and a lot of people swim and dive there, but we assumed that it was because they thought they were doing a service. They were getting rid of a monster. So, you know, that cannot be neglected, that we don't try to offset people's fear. There's a lot of people that are not one with the ocean or the universe, and we have to continue to address uh, and educate against fear. Jaws is being re-released. It's going to start all over again. You know, more generations that are afraid. And the newspaper, every day, the newspaper, this summer so far, shark, 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 and there are horrible accidents. Um, and yes, the death rate is low, but there are victims, and that's what's in the newspaper, you know? No one talks about, oh, it's an apex predator, and we need to protect it, blah, 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 blah. You know, it's solely, vicious monster eats child. You know, that's <laughs> their favorite headline. So, you know, this has to be talked about from, from all of us that have a chance to engage with people. Do you know how many people were killed by sharks last year? Six. Yes. Ten. Worldwide. How do you, what do you do realistically in terms of enforcement for, say, like, you know, the local fishermen that are just hand-wired, you know, sort of impoverished fishermen and they do catch some things as, as bite -hatch? Yeah, you need to be creative. Um, so uh, one thing you can do is you can remove the economic incentive to fish for sharks. Uh, and so maybe you know one idea, and we're trying to pr run, do this in the British Virgin Islands, where instead of focusing on the fishermen, you focus on the restaurants. And you talk to the restaurants and say, don't buy sharks. Uh, and then the, the fishermen will quickly learn, I don't have anybody to sell my shark to, so I'm going to release it. Uh, and these, these um, it's going to differ per island, uh, but removing the economic incentive is, is, is probably the strongest way to do it without forcing it on them. Uh, you could go around and handcuffing people and throwing people in jail and giving them $50,000 fines, but that, I found that most islands uh, enforcement can be kind of lax uh, because it's your cousin or, uh, exactly. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so so you, you have to be kind of creative and um, there, there's actually a lot of examples of animals that we once thought of as food that have that we no longer think is of food. So things like turtles. Uh, how, how did uh, turtles become protected? How did how did the front row here start to think that turtles are something that are not food? One of those is there's a local NGO who works on turtles. Uh, maybe you need a local NGO that works on sharks. You actually have one. <laughs> Two. In fact, I think sharks are not so re restaurants very much here. Emotionally divided among friends, either. Mm -hmm. so. If you go to the. In the case of like, sustenance fishing, what, what can we do about that? You know, it's not the, the dress pack, it's not the economic, it's just the mm -hmm. it, That's probably a matter of education. Just like smoking cigarettes, you, you tell them that it's bad, and then 5% of the people will listen. Uh, you say only. Uh, three people were killed. How many people were attacked? I don't know. <laughs> uh, more than three. <laughs> I'd like to suggest an alternative to the word attacked. Um, sharks don't attack human beings. They mistakenly take a bite or nip. <laughs> and the idea of you know, sharks actually targeting humans is. Oh. You know, it's so, Peter Benchley's fault. Yeah, but people are saying that. And I will say, though, I went to Zazu last night, and I attacked that cheeseburger. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that was, that was not a shark. Yeah. <laughs>